That is a big question here, Zhao Yang. And even in the short term, much of that aid can't get to the people at risk of starvation. They're cut off by conflict. Relief workers have not been able to reach them in the danger zone. So what is the long-term solution? Let's bring in Omolola Adele Oso. She's the executive director and co-founder of the Social Justice Group Act for Accountability. Omolola, welcome to the program. Thank you. So um, we heard Stephen, UN Stephen Bryan talk about what Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, Nigeria, at this moment, conflict seems right. to be the common denominator, especially with the first three. Security, clearly a big problem. Yes. So how do you guarantee um, aid reaches people when aid workers can't even have access to the areas that need help? So I think it's uh, on two different fronts. You have the UN that also has its own restrictions when it's dealing in areas of conflict. You know, there, there's a limitation to how far their aid workers can go, um, but they also need to start relying more on local NGOs. Uh, a lot of local NGOs have built trust in communities where um, the UN might be a target, especially when their uh, convoys are moving around with a lot of heavy security. They are targets. They're literally moving targets. For example, in Nigeria, there was a convoy attacked. So it has to be local governments stepping up their part when it comes to security and supporting of humanitarian um, organizations. But I also think that there has to be the influx of bringing in and training local NGOs quickly and rapidly to be able to respond where the UN agencies and inter uh, humanitarian aid cannot get to. Um, we also heard Stephen Bryan say, O'Brien say the famine and threat of famine in East Africa is the largest humanitarian crisis since the creation of UN, something you and I were just yes. talking about. Um, so how do you mobilize long-term coordinated solutions here? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that has to happen is we have to deal with the immediate need, uh, the, the quick immediate need and flux of uh, aid to the people that are starving. And that, who's responsible for that? Is it the NGOs that you mentioned? Is it local authorities so allowing access? Again, it's a combination of so okay. many things. The UN has its own restrictions, uh, but they are leading the charter in asking for governments around the world to support the, the $5 billion, I believe, is what is needed to address this growing starvation crisis immediately by the end of March or by April. Um, but then you also have to have the, the governments inside these countries really making it easier for humanitarian aid to get there. But there is also corruption. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, we've seen the case in Nigeria where food that is supposed to go to um, people in never displacement reaches camp, never reaches them. We have footage of uh, of rice being rebagged into secondary economy bags and sold at the market. So there's food that's not getting where it needs to go. Um, there's also the lack of transparency of how the money is flowing in and out when it comes to who's getting the money and where is the money going. So there has to be a lot of things happening, but ultimately in the end, for it to work, for a sustainable response to work, we have to go, uh, countries have to go from early warning to early action. And that is the part where capacity is needed. They need help with capacity, they need training, they need people, um, but they also need to make sure that they can deal with their own internal conflict and challenges. Drought we can't control. It's a nature. Which is what we're seeing in Somalia. Exactly. And this is not the first time we've seen not. Somalia go through this kind it of crisis. Not, but the country has not done enough to be able to go from the warning aspect of we have a drought to what do we need to do to make sure when the drought gets here or it is we're here, prepared. we're prepared. And that is always missing in the plans. When it comes to South Sudan, for example, we have a lot of um, people leaving South Sudan, fleeing the conflict, going to Uganda. Um, what the humanitarian aid can do right now is support Uganda because they're taking a huge amount of refugees, support their refugee plan to be able to make sure they can cope and, and we don't have another uh, humanitarian crisis in Sudan, uh, uh, sorry, in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Then we have Kenya. Kenya fighting to close, you know, da da Dadaab, mm -hmm. the largest uh, refugee camp in the world, which currently has over 300,000 people that have been living there. You have children that were born and have never known anywhere else. What's going to happen if the Kenyan government decides to close that uh, refugee camp? Where do those people go? How do we make sure that the displacement and the relocation of these populations do not make them vulnerable 
to a second kind of crisis. Oh, Manola, we have to, I have to ask you quickly. The UN has appealed for more than $4 billion in aid by July, just a few months from now. What happens if they cannot raise this kind of money? Unfortunately, every day they can't raise that money, people die. And that's the truth. Uh, if they cannot raise the money, then we are going to be here tomorrow, another year from now, five years from now, talking about a larger crisis of humanity. And we're talking about a population of over 20 million people that could be lost forever, but you have a new class of underdeveloped population of people. Omolola Adele Oso, thank you so much.